this is the most difficult session, at least in the Middle East. This is the time after lunch. If you go to sleep for an hour or two. So if you need coffee or anything to keep you awake, it's out here. Our first speaker will be Lisa Hajjal, uh, who just flew in from Beirut. Uh, and is from Santa Barbara. And then uh, Chase Snyder will follow. And uh, each one will speak about 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up. Okay, well, thank you all uh, for organizing this and allowing me to come back from Beirut for a quick visit. Uh, the title of my talk is called Customizing Extreme Violence, a Critical Assessment of Israel's War Record in Gaza. And I'm going to be um, uh, you know, sort of focusing specifically on Israel since uh, 2000. And I think it continues with some of the conversations we had this morning. Like, I do believe that there is a sort of sui generis role uh, for Israel in terms of both strategies of violence and legal, uh, sort of the legal rationales that couple those things. But just to sort of begin, if you think about um, the, the notion of IHL, or the relationship between humanitarian and war, uh, which to the uninitiated may seem strange, but it really developed back in the 19th century with the emergence of uh, sort of the creation of a universal category of the human being that would eventually come to include all people. Um, and we can think about one of the key episodes in this development in the 19th century was the transnational abolitionist movement to end chattel slavery, in which abolitionists were norm entrepreneurs um, who pioneered this nascent concept of humanitarianism, which could be defined as identifying with the suffering of strangers or others because of a recognition of shared humanity and acting upon that recognition to change conditions that cause such suffering. And so the linkage between humanitarianism and war comes slightly later, but it also is motivated by a politics of recognition and goal-oriented transformation. In this case, the recognition of the humanity of enemies and efforts to forge new rules to balance the inevitable harms of warfare with the obligation on war makers to refrain from causing unnecessary or excessive harm, especially to those not actively engaged in war. That would be civilians or injured soldiers, or enemy soldiers. And of course, these balancing obligations were vastly expanded uh, and elaborated over the decades you know, leading to the uh, promulgation of the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Now, I'm not going to, since so many of the other speakers have talked about the main principles of IHL, I'm just going to sort of state what they are, um, the distinction, proportionality, necessity, and humane treatment. But it will come up in what I want to talk about. Um, so one question I would say is, you know, in recent, you know, across time certainly, but in recent decades, you know, the nature of war has changed significantly. For example, the invention of new weapons and new forms of conflict. So one question is, how does IHL remain relevant and binding um, while being adaptive to these changes? And one very important way is the role of state practice, and particularly the practice of powerful states in promoting what is or should be legal in the context of war and armed conflict. So customary IHL, according to the International Committee of the Red Cross, quote, derives from a general practice accepted as law and that the international community believes that such practice is required as a matter of law. And another way in which IHL rules are clarified or modified is through the enforcement of international criminal law, which dates back to the end of World War II, but only really began being put into significant use after the end of the Cold War. So what I'm really going to be focusing on is Israel's record of militarized violence against Palestinians since 2000. The ways in which the Israeli military and political uh, leadership have chosen to make war do not comport with the bedrock rules of IHL. However, Israeli officials go to great lengths to frame their policies and practices as legal and ethical. And because Israel is a powerful state, one question at hand is whether these Israeli state practices may become, quote, the new custom for wars against stateless enemies. And it's indisputable that the Israeli model has been very influential. It's been influential for the US war on terror, particularly in regard to torture and targeted killing. And the Israeli-influenced US model has been influential in other countries, including the United Kingdom, which recently authorized the targeted killing of two citizens in the multinational military campaign against the Islamic State in Syria. 
to set the context um, for what I'm going to argue, it's worth quoting the off-cited words of Daniel Reisner, who headed the International Law Division of the Military Advocate General's Unit in the first part of uh, the 2000s. Reisner offers an exceptionally frank explanation of the dynamical relationship between Israel's violent state practice and legal interpretation. In the quote I'm about to read you, um, he's referring to targeted killing, and he says, quote, we defended a policy that is on the edge. In that sense, the ILD is a body that restrains action but does not stop it. And he continues, what we are seeing now is a revision of international law. If you do something for long enough, the world will accept it. The whole of international law is now based on the notion that an act that is forbidden today becomes permissible if executed by enough countries. International law progresses through violations. We invented the targeted assassination thesis, and we had to push it. At first, there were protrusions that made it hard to insert <clears throat> e easily into the legal molds. Eight years later, it is at, in the center of the bounds of legitimacy. Of course, that's a highly uh, uh, debatable claim, but it's worth noting. Now, before moving into account of Israel's 21st century record of violence against Palestinians, let me state very clearly that the war model paradigm for Gaza, as well as the West Bank, is inherently flawed because the territories remain occupied because Israel retains effective control. Under international consensus-based interpretations of IHL, massive use of military force by an occupying state against occupied uh, territories whose civilian population are protected persons would be illegal. But by the same measure, uh, indiscriminate violence and the targeting of civilians by militants from an occupied population is also illegal, although there is a right to fight against foreign occupation as set out in the 1977 Additional Protocol 1 of the Geneva Conventions. And that protocol is widely regarded as the contemporary articulation of customary international law for asymmetric wars. Israel rejects both the protocol, at least those elements of the right to fight, and the principle of occupied people's right to fight. So Israel has staked out a position that Gaza is no longer occupied in order to justify its own claimed right to wage war there. This interpretive deoccupation has a much longer history dating back to 1967 and arguably a few years earlier when Israeli officials asserted that the newly captured West Bank and Gaza were not occupied but administered territories for reasons I have to explain. Although this interpretation never obtained international credibility, it became the cornerstone for Israel's doctrine on the state's rights in the West Bank and Gaza. In the 1990s, Israel's position took a new course in response to political changes resulting from the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, notably Israeli military redeployment from Palestinian population centers, or Areas A, and the establishment of a Palestinian Authority. As a, or PA. as a result of these changes, officials asserted that areas under the semi-autonomous control of PA had become differently foreign. And this became highly significant um, following the breakdown of negotiations in July 2000 and the start of the Second Intifada in September of that year. <coughs> so Israel characterized the Palestinian protests at the start of the Second Intifada as acts of aggression and its own acts as national self-defense. The military's rules of engagement were loosened and heavy weapons, including tanks and helicopter gunships, were deployed against unarmed protesters. The justification for this war model was premised on assertions that the law enforcement model of the First Intifada, that would be policing and riot control tactics, was no longer viable because the military was out of Palestinian areas and because some Palestinians possessed um, arms and thus constituted a foreign armed adversary. Officials described the Second Intifada as an armed conflict short of war and asserted Israel's self-defense right to attack an enemy entity while denying that those stateless enemies had any right to use force even in self-defense. Now, over the past 15 years since the start of the Second Intifada, several events provide especially vivid illumination of the trajectory of Israeli state practice and legal interpretation that I want to trace. So I'm going to highlight a few distinct events. First, it was November of 2000 when the Israeli government for the first time acknowledged its long-expanding targeted killing policy um, following the assassination of Hussein Abayat in a missile strike that also killed two women bystanders. 
So now that extrajudicial execution, which previously had been done and denied, was out of the closet, officials asserted its lawfulness on the following bases. One, Palestinians were to blame for the hostilities, which constituted a war of terror against Israel. Two, the laws of war permit states to kill their enemies. Three, targeted individuals were taking bombs who had to be killed because they could not be arrested. And four, killing terrorists by means of assassination is a legitimate form of national self-defense. And I would note that this is exactly the same argument that it, the United States adopted when it embraced the national uh, targeted killing policy of, of the year a year later. The deaths of untargeted civilians were termed, in accordance with the discourse of war, collateral damage. So between September of 2000 and August of 2014, approximately 440 Palestinians were killed during targeted killing operations, of whom 278 were the targets. And of course, this excludes thousands killed by other means. The second event occurs in, in late March of 2002, when Israel launched a massive military campaign in the West Bank in response to a deadly suicide bombing in Netanya uh, by a Hamas operative on Passover Eve. Operation Defensive Shield signaled a change in Israel's strategies of violence. The new strategy, termed mowing the grass, was devised to inflict punishing levels of violence and destruction with the aim of both debilitating present capacities and deterring future violence against Israel. In practice, mowing the grass involved directing attacks not only against militants and suicide bombers and their abettors, but also attacking the broader infrastructure that recruited, trained, and protected them. So during Operation Defensive Shield, Israeli forces re-entered many parts of Area A and laid waste to the infrastructures of the PA. The most decisive event in Operation Defensive Shield was the Battle of Jenin, which was Israel's largest military operation since the 1982 invasion of Lebanon. Although many Jenin residents had fled before the fighting began on April 2nd, over 1,000 remained and Palestinian fighters from several factions were prepared for the incursion into the Janine refugee camp. On April 9, 13 Israeli soldiers, all reservists, were killed in an ambush. And this generated intense political pressure within Israel to take the camp quickly with no more soldier cas casualties. So consequently, instead of sending soldiers into buildings to capture or kill fighters, some buildings were shelled first or Palestinians were commandeered as human shields to proceed and protect soldiers. This is the sort of the convention definition of human shields. To finish the Janin operation, the military deployed massive armored bulldozers that flattened everything in their path. And at the time, although the US government criticized Israel for excessive use of force in Janin, a year later, the Pentagon purchased some of Israel's armored bulldozers and used them during op uh, urban operations in occupied Iraq. In retrospect, Operation Defensive Shield, and especially the Battle of Jenin, were pivotal in the evolution of Israeli military strategy. The decision at that time to use ground troops rather than aerial bombing was deemed more appropriately proportional. But urban operations are tactically different, difficult and more dangerous to the state's own forces. The death of even a small number of soldiers highlighted the Jewish-Israeli public's extreme aversion to casualties. And this casualty aversion inspired soldiers at that time to use human shields to protect themselves. But that practice was subsequently prohibited by the Israeli High Court of Justice in a 2005 ruling. So the confluence of these factors motivated a strategic shift towards greater violence projected from the air or from a distance, which is less risky to soldiers, while at the same time being less discriminating and proportionate to those in targeted areas. The third event, which demonstrated the shift towards aerial violence, was the targeted killing operation on July 22, 2002, in which an F-16 launched a one-ton bomb in the densely populated um, Gaza neighborhood of Al Daraj in order to assassinate Salah Shahade, a Hamas leader. So the bomb destroyed the apartment building where Shahade lived and eight nearby buildings and partially destroyed nine others. In addition to Shahade and his guard, 14 Palestinians, including eight children, were killed and more than 150 people were injured. In this instance, the military responded to public outcry about the size of the bomb the targeting of a residential neighborhood, and the high casualty rate, or high at that time, uh, by conducting an investigation. 
and the findings of this internal investigation justified the killing of Shahade as a perpetrator of tar terrorist violence while conceding that there had been, quote, shortcomings in the information available, namely the presence of, quote, innocent civilians in the vicinity of what was claimed to be Shahade's operational hideout, also known as his home. Um, this rhetoric of innocent civilians amidst legitimate targets foreshadowed Israel's arguably sui generis new use of the concept of human shields that would come to bear on subsequent wars. Israel reframed enemy civilians as de facto human shields being used by the enemies against whom Israel was waging war in order to shift blame for civilian casualties caused by Israeli strikes onto the organizations being targeted. Moreover, the decision to use aerial technology, whether planes or drones, to bomb individuals rather than using manned capture operations illustrates the strategy of prioritizing the safety of soldiers. The logic of this prioritization was promoted as ethical in an influential 2005 essay authored by Asa Kasher, a Tel Aviv University professor who also serves as the ethics advisor to the Israeli military, and Amos Yadlin, a general in the army. And they write, and I quote, usually the duty to minimize casualties among combatants during combat is the last on the list of priorities, or next to last if terrorists are excluded from the category of non-combatants. We firmly reject such a conception because it is immoral. A combatant is a citizen in uniform. In Israel, quite often he is a conscript or on reserve duty. The fact that persons involved in terror reside and act in the vicinity of persons not involved in terror is not a reason for jeopardizing the combatant's life in their pursuit. So this prioritization of the safety of one's own troops, which has become a feature of Israeli military strategizing, runs completely contrary to the IHL principle of civilian immunity, and it fabricates from whole cloth the civilianization of war-waging combatants. It also fundamentally contradicts the fact that IHL makes no room for distinguishing among civilians on the basis of national identity. Gregoire Chamu, in a theory of the drone, describes this Israeli effort to promote the hierarchization of bodies and the civilianization of war-waging soldiers, quote, the principle of immunity for the imperial combatant. And he minces no words in describing the implications. Quoting Shambu, the project is nothing less than the dynamiting of the law of armed conflict and was, as it was established in the second half of the 20th century, an evisceration of the principles of international law in favor of a nationalism of self-preservation. Now, the fourth event in the trajectory of tracing was Israel's 2005 unilateral withdrawal of ground troops from Gaza, which was preceded by the forced removal of Jewish settlers and followed by the total sealing off of the Strip. Following the 2006 Palestinian legislative elections that brought Hamas to power and the 2007 routing of the Palestinian Authority from Gaza, the siege of the Strip intensified. So this sequence of events bolstered Israel's claims that Gaza was a terrorist control, hostile entity populate, populated by terrorist sympathizers and civilians used by Hamas as human shields. This official framing was comparable in Israel's legal discourse and military strategizing to Hezbollah-controlled areas of Lebanon following the unilateral withdrawal from South Lebanon in 2000. So the result was the Lebanonization of Gaza as foreign, hostile, attackable, and where the safety of civilians, even during an Israeli attack, was not Israel's responsibility. So as Neve Gordon and Nicola Perugini explain, quote, the post hoc framing is crucial to the process of legitimizing bombing that kills large numbers of civilians, since it allows Israel to claim that violence was used in accordance with international law and is, as a consequence, ethical. The fifth event was Israel's massively destructive 2006 war on Lebanon, which Israelis call the Second Lebanon War. During the invasion, the military employed a strategy of deliberately disproportionate force. This strategy was termed the Dahia Doctrine in reference to the total destruction of the southern Beirut uh, suburb of Dahia, which is heavily uh, populated, populated by Shia. The existence of this doctrine was uh, revealed in 2008 by Major General Gadi Eisenkot, who had been the head of the Northern Command in 2006. He stated, and I quote, what happened in the Dahia quarter of Beirut in 2006 will happen in every village from which Israel is fired on. 
we will apply disproportionate force on it and cause great damage and destruction there. From our standpoint, these are not civilian villages, they are military bases. This is not a recommendation, this is a plan, and it has been approved. The strategic logic of the Dahia Doctrine was elaborated uh, a month later, in October of 2008, by Gabby Saboni, a retired general and strategic analyst. Gaboni described it as, and I quote, the principle of a disproportionate strike against the enemy's weak points as a primary war effort and operations to dis disable the enemy's missile launching cap capabilities as a secondary war e effort. Such a response aims at inflicting damage and meeting out punishment to an extent that will demand long and expensive reconstruction processes. The strike must be carried out as quickly as possible and must prioritize damaging assets over seeking out each and every launcher. Such a response will create a lasting memory, thereby increasing Israeli deterrence and reducing the likelihood of hostilities against Israel for an extended period. Indeed, two months later, after these revelations about the strategic logic of the Dahlia Doctrine, Gaza was subjected to a similarly massive and disproportionate use of force when Israel launched Operation Cast Lead. The levels of extreme violence meted out on Gaza between the 27th of December 2008 and the 18th of January 2009 made Operation Defensive Shield and the Battle of Jenin pale in comparison. In April 2009, the United Nations Human Rights Council authorized an international fact-finding mission to investigate Operation Cast Lead, which was headed by South African journalist Richard Goldstone. So the Goldstone Report found that both Israeli military and Palestinian militants had committed war crimes and possible crimes against humanity. According to the report in regard to Israel, the IDF targeted, quote, people of Gaza as a whole, not distinguishing between civilians and combatants, and at times intentionally attacking civilians. Also, the report found that the targeting of civilian infrastructure was deliberate, systematic, and part of a larger strategy. So the Goldstone Report became the object of defensive and scornful propaganda by Israeli officials and other foreign supporters of Israel for most US politicians. While the Goldstone Report stands as one official record of Operation Castlade, it did not lead to any consequences for those responsible for war crimes. In November 2012, Israel decided to wage another war on Gaza, Operation Pillar of Defense which started with a targeted killing and was an entirely aerial campaign of bombing that lasted eight days. Now, the war on Gaza in the summer of 2014 was by far the most violent and destructive episode to date. Operation Pillar of Defense, I mean, it's a complicated start, but it was motivated by Net the Netanyahu government's uh, desire to foil the Hamas Palestinian Authority rapprochement, which had taken hold in April. During this 51-day onslaught, Israel put to use all of the military strategies of intentional, extreme, non-discriminating amounts of violence. In terms of the overarching objective of the war, Israel was mowing the grass to destroy not only present Hamas and other Islamist capacities, but those organizations' very existence and the possibility of a future recuperation. The bombing camp campaign included more than 6,000 air attacks and the firing of about 50,000 artillery and tank shells, which combined has been estimated as a total of 21 kilotons of high explosives. The weapons included drones and American he Apache helicopters firing US-made Hellfire missiles and American F-16s carrying 2,000 pound bombs. These levels of force and forms of weaponry are typically reserved for wars against foreign militaries, not populations in occupied territories. There was a clear evidence of the Dahi Doctrine to cause so much damage that it would require years of rebuilding. The targets included a vast array of infrastructure, including desalination plants, electrical grids, hospitals, schools, universities, and every structure identified with or alleged to be under the control of the Hamas government. Toward the end of the war, Israel bombed and flattened several of Gaza's few high-rise apartment buildings and shopping centers. There was also patent uh, evidence of patent disregard for the lives and safety of Gazans who were trapped in densely populated areas with nowhere and no means to escape. By the end of the war, more than 2,100 Palestinians had been killed and more than 11,000 had been injured, the vast majority of whom were civilians. Whole families were wiped out and whole neighborhoods were razed. 
And there's evidence that the doctrine of prioritizing the safety of soldiers led to some instances of reprisal attacks for Israeli casualties. During the assault on, Shuja, on the Shuja'iyah district of Gaza City, Palestinian militants put up a surprisingly strong fight, which resulted in the killing of 13 Israeli soldiers and the wounding of up to 100 more. After that, the area was pounded with an absolutely massive attack with some of the heaviest weapons in Israel's arsenal. Incomparable levels of indiscriminate and massive violence were meted out on other densely populated areas as well, including Rafah, Beit Lahia, and Khan Yunis. So by way of a short conclusion, we may, might consider whether Israel's strategic doctrines might become the new custom for asymmetric wars. Israel has engaged repeatedly in, patch, in um, practices that contradict the bedrock rules of IHL, with devastating consequences for those on the receiving end of their violence. Israel's ability to customize its own use of extreme violence, and thus far to avoid serious repercussions or accountability, is certainly going to tempt other states engaged in asymmetric conflicts to follow similar courses and assert similar justifications. And Banu Bargu noted one such example exactly of the Turkish government very recently invoking what amounts to the Dahiya Doctrine for bombing of a, uh, a Kurdish uh, village in, in northern Iraq. This is how international, um, this is how customary international law develops through state practice. However, other recent developments suggest that at least the justifications may be you know, undercut, even if there is no criminal accountability for specific individuals responsible for war crimes. And this is a very perspective thought. In late 2014, Palestine was recognized as a non-member state by the UN General Assembly, and on January 1, 2015, the PA acceded to the Rome Statute to join the International Criminal Court. Later that month, the ICC prosecutor opened a preliminary inquiry into Operation Pillar of Defense. Now, an ICC prosecutor's um, inquiry is not an investigation, although it may be a precursor. But I would argue that the, um, the value of a high-level inquiry uh, is the subjection of Israeli state practice to exposure and analysis about how it comports with or violates current rules and customary of customary IHL. Indeed, the fact that this inquiry has been launched is a vivid example of the high stakes battles over what is legal in war. And if, this state, if these stakes were not high, there would have been no reason for Prime Minister Netanyahu to condemn the ICC prosecutor's initiative or the mobilization of a state-sponsored and well-coordinated anti-ICC media campaign. So my final point is this, interpretation of what is lawful in war, especially in this century when warring has changed so dramatically, is a reflection of the politics of war. And therefore, on the transnationalized terrain where state practice and legal interpretation may or may not ripen into custom, there is room for other kinds of politics of war as well. This involves the marshalling of evidence and empirical information and judging it against the law. There is, in other words, room for scholars and activists who are knowledgeable about IHL to participate in the making or defending of customs that seek to protect rather than deliberately harm humans caught up in war. And so in that regard, I think that this conference is one example of the kinds of alternative uh, terrain that we can do in the politics of war. First, thanks so much, Neve and Nicola and the Watson Institute and the Middle East Studies uh, Department here at Brown for putting this together. Uh, our itinerary for the next 20 minutes or so is a quick jog through the history of use and bellow and in international humanitarian law and law in wars both symmetrical and asymmetrical with a focus on the United States experience. Just so we're all on the same page here, I think we are, the, we want to redefine pardon the retread, use and bellow in international humanitarian law near synonyms that refer to questions of how war is waged. Uh, use ad bellum, but for law at war, is the question of whether or not to wage a war. That's related to just war theory in that discourse. Uh, now there's a lot of skepticism in this room here today about what the laws of war do, what they really mean. Uh, I share the skepticism, and I think it's important to see uh, the laws of war, uh, international humanitarian law, doing much more to license, facilitate, and optimize the use of military violence 
than to soften or restrain it. And this skeptical or cynical interpretation of the laws of war is something that gets renewed with by each generation, by uh, Ethan Nicola's excellent recent book, by Roger Norman and Chris Yachnik's uh, landmark law review article from about 20 years ago. And you could probably trace that all the way back to Calgacus, the noble barbarian whom Tacitus used as a sock puppet to express his own acerbic remarks about the weight of civilized war some 2,000 years ago. And uh, though the temptation of IHL atheism is strong and I think very warranted, it's always useful to go back and take a look at those times and places where IHL really has had some meaning. Uh, and to think about what made it meaningful, what circumstances, what power relations. And uh, one such golden time and place is uh, continental European warfare between Westphalia and the Great War, with the Napoleonic parentheses and plenty of exceptions. This is a kind of golden age for international lawyers concerned with the issue, and I think nostalgia for this time and place is kind of dissolved even now throughout the whole discourse of IHL, and it's good to be aware of that. Now, what made IHL meaningful, the laws of war meaningful back then, was that armed conflict was more or less symmetrical, roughly speaking. There was a multipolar state system and rough parity between great powers in Europe. Uh, you have a war fought between similarly sized and similarly armed and trained forces fighting for similar goals, usually not ideological, but nakedly acquisitive, fighting for property and real estate. The armies would get the property, the prince keeps the real estate. Uh, there is also a shared diplomatic, military, and legal culture that interpreted these battles and their outcomes the same way. And all of this is, of course, not because of a special effort by international lawyers, but rather an outgrowth of the European geopolitics of that particular time with, to repeat, a rough parity of great powers, with exceptions in that long stretch, that made adhering to the laws of war worthwhile for most parties through the incentivizing force of reciprocity. A uh, couple quick examples. The Battle of Malplaquet in 1709, the French inflict tremendous casualties on their coalition of opponents, far greater than they themselves suffer. But they retreat first, and all of Europe sees this as a real defeat for Louis XIV. Uh, the laws of armed conflict confined this, all the violence to that one battle, and when the battle ended, there were rules to interpret, rules that were you know, somewhat obeyed. Uh, in 1742, during the Seven Years' War, the Battle of Chotositz is won by the Prussians. Frederick the Great's forces have the chance to annihilate the retreating Austrian enemy, but they choose not to. Uh, that's not what Clausewitz would preach or say that war is about, but that happened. Now, the Prussians also suffer greater casualties than their foe, but they're still widely seen as winning the battle because the Austrians retreated first. Uh, now, this golden age, a golden place of symmetrical conflict, remains the touchstone of international humanitarian law from its birth at the Battle of Solferino. And nostalgia for this kind of warfare is held not just by kinky amoralists like Carl Schmidt, but also mainstream <laughs> military theorists and historians like Liddell Hart. Uh, and it remains a very important part of the official version and official self-image of IHL in its symmetrical heyday. Uh, at the same time, but in a different place, the laws of war mean something very different, or perhaps not very much at all, and that's in laws of colonial conquest, imperial wars abroad. And, uh, and that's not really the official version of IHL, and I saw this uh, expressed in a very literal, physical way. I was at a museum in Geneva the summer before last, uh, not the Red Cross's own museum, but there was a big exhibit in the old town dedicated to the achievements of the ICRC. And you know, the achievements are really, I don't mean to scoff at them. And those real achievements would be on tabletops, you know, lit up so you could read them with you know, images. But you'd pull a little sleeve out, uh, a kind of drawer, and there would be text telling you very different things, a different history of IHL. For instance, telling you that Gustave Moigne, who while serving as the president of the IRC, ICRC also served as consul of the Congo Free State 
Switzerland, and that he believed that Negro states cannot adhere to the Geneva Convention as they are, quote, still too savage to be associated with the humanitarianism that inspired such a treaty. You pull another sleeve and you read that the ICRC was silent about the German campaign of genocide against the Herero people from 1904 to 1911. Uh, so you can draw a straight line uh, of international humanitarian lawyers and you know their founders, uh, uh, Martin, Swanye, others, to contemporary international humanitarian lawyers at the ICRC or uh, critical jurist like David Cole. Uh, but you can also draw a straight line, I think, to an American jurist like John Yu, cast by many liberal legalists as a barbarian outsider who somehow got a law degree. But as Frederick McGray has, I think, convincingly shown, John Yu and Jay Bybee in Ninth Appellate Circuit Justice are not wholly outside the tradition of the laws of war by licensing harm, in this particular case, torture, to unprivileged combatants who used to be called with greater frankness, savages. Uh, I think you and Bybee, maybe the traditionalists isn't the right word, but they are authentic reactionary throwbacks to a major branch of international humanitarian law. And I say this not to praise you and Bybee because I really don't like what they've done, but I think this needs to be said to give an honest assessment of IHL's true history and what it has really meant and really done, especially in asymmetric conflict. Uh, now, after 9-11, I read frequently that the United States must now get ready to confront a whole new kind of enemy, the likes of which it had never fought before. Uh, this really isn't the case. Uh, uh, the United States has fought irregular enemies, non-state actors throughout its history. This is perhaps the main stem of American warfare. I don't, you know all this already, but I'll just run through them. The conquest of Indian lands and against Indian nations all the way west, uh, fighting the regulars in the Mexican War, colonial war in the Philippines, counterinsurgency there. Our Vietnam War did have a strong symmetrical component as the North Vietnamese, heavily aided by both China and USSR, did have conventional troops and their own air force, but it was also, and this has lived on stronger in every encounter, insurgency war against guerrillas, urban and rural. Uh, and I think asymmetric warfare almost makes inevitably for, puts an incredible strain on use and bellow as we would like to know it or nostalgically remember it from the golden era of uh, 18th century Europe. Uh, this, is, this is nothing, nothing new. Uh, uh, two examples uh, that show just how thoroughly IHL is wired for symmetry and how it has an extremely spotty record when it comes to asymmetrical warfare. Uh, first at the level of doctrine, and these are two examples from our, our Filipino War. Uh, when Teddy Roosevelt wanted a legal justification for the ruse that captured insurgent leader Emilio Aguinaldo, he called up his friendly acquaintance Theodore Wolsey, an expert in international law at Yale. And Wolsey replied eventually by saying that savages, then the technical term, uh, for unprivileged combatants were not entitled to protection under the laws of war, so ruses were fair game. Uh, and that's part of the mainstream. That's not outside the history of international humanitarian law. That's, you know, that was a legal decision made by a legal expert and somewhat typical for an asymmetrical conflict. Second, at the level of enforcement, how the laws of armed conflict are actually enforced by a great power in the context of asymmetrical war. Uh, Major Edwin Glenn, uh, someone with a law degree, is convicted of torturing Filipino prisoners of war. Uh, and he eventually is he's tried, he's convicted, but then it's commuted, and his Sentence is limited just to the loss of nine months half pay and being sent down 35 places on the officer promotion list. Uh, the punchline is that years later, in 1914, Major Glenn, convicted torture in an asymmetric war, is chosen to update West Point's Law of War Manual. <laughs> now, John Fabian Witt, who's a really excellent book, Lincoln's Code, that disagrees with 
conclusions, but I highly recommend a stimulating, very well written book. Uh, he, he stresses that, uh, in, to quote him, in most Indian conflicts, and we could, I think, say all asymmetric conflicts, the majesty of the law more often gave way to a mix of tragedy and farce. I think that's a fair assessment. And Witt is someone who is really a true believer in the project of the laws of war in international humanitarian law. Uh, and he strains a bit to keep defending it. He sees Glenn's appointment to update the West Point's Law of War manual as a symbolic triumph of the Law of War. I can't help but see it as something less than triumphant. Uh, anyway, there is a surprising amount of military and legal continuity between these Indian and earlier counterinsurgent wars from the deeper American past and the global war on terror today. Uh, even aside from the fact that the term Indian country is still in common parlance to describe unpacified areas of South, was in South Vietnam in the past or Afghanistan today by soldiers. Uh, but looking at some of the, the, the signal uh, incidences of, of the use of, of the laws of war in the war on terror, they, they may look new and novel and unprecedented, but dig a little bit in their echoes from the American past. I'm thinking of Omar Khadr, 15-year-old Canadian national, captured in Afghanistan, prosecuted for murder in violation of the laws of war. And that seemed on its face to many to be kind of a novel charge. Is it more about killing people? What's this murder if it's on a battlefield? Uh, and it seemed typical of Guantanamo's Jerry Reef war courts making up their own kind of laws they see fit. But in fact, the Guantanamo prosecution of Omar Khadr is has an echo, an earlier echo, in Wawinape, a 16-year-old Dakota warrior sentenced to death for murders and massacres of, in 1862. Indefinite detention at Guantanamo, 49 prisoners, and they are prisoners, not detainees, are uh, in that category now. And this has been condemned by the ACLU and other groups, rightly, but also by saying that this is un-American. It deviates from our great tradition of habeas corpus and that it's a horrible, unprecedented violation of the rule of law. But this indefinite detention also harkens back to the punishment imposed on an Apache chief named Eskiminizin in the early 1880s. Uh, and I can think of at least one legal case from the deep American past in the Seminole Wars that still has some precedential life in it, strange as that may seem. Uh, in 2000, 11, the Guantanamo War Court prosecutors grasped for a historic precedent to support their claim that providing aid, non-military but propaganda aid, is a war crime under the jurisdiction of military commissions uh, in their prosecution of Ali al-Balul. And they turned to an 1818 case when Major General Andrew Jackson had invaded Spanish Florida in search of runaway slaves with the intent of returning them to their masters, and the Seminoles in what is now Florida resisted this invasion of their land. Jackson's incursion kicked off the First Seminole War. And during the conflict, Jackson captured two British men who were living among the Seminoles. One of the men had written letters uh, in support of the Seminoles' land and treaty rights. And Jackson used this as evidence to accuse the men of inciting the Seminoles to savage warfare, quote unquote, against the US. He convened a special court martial and had the two men executed. I'm quoting from a very fine analysis of this you know, a bit of legal work from the Indian Country Today Media Network. Uh, now, however one interprets the history of use and bellow controversies that stem from asymmetrical conflicts, they, they have a surprising importance in our public discourse about war today. Uh, it may seem like a minor detail, these use and bellow questions, questions about, again, how war is waged, but they pop up in, in, throughout American history. Uh, starting with the Declaration of Independence, in which Jefferson rails against King George III for, quote, waging uncivilized warfare against the colonies, for stirring up, quote, merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Uh, there's the aforementioned instance of Andrew Jackson seizing on violations of the laws of armed conflict, what he took because he did pay tribute though, and, and, make a, and he made a casus belli out of that, a case for war to uh, fight the Seminoles. More recently, in March of 2003, 
President George W. Bush added on, slathered on more justification for his invasion of Iraq by claiming that, quote, Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men, women, and children as a shield for his own military. Final atrocity against his people. I want Americans and all the world to know that coalition forces will make every effort to space innocent civilians, spare innocent civilians from harm. So here, the accused use of human shields becomes not just a violation of use and bellow, but also a part of the casus belli and feeds you know, the question of whether the war is just. It, it fuels use and bellow. And even more recently, where when Hafez al-Assad used chemical weapons, or there's some controversy of that, but I think the consensus is that he probably did. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Is that about Bashar or Hafez? Oh, Bashar. Yeah. Bashar, sorry. 2013. This, yeah, 2013. This became a casus belli for many in the Obama administration, including for, for instance, humanitarian lawyer Samantha Power. Uh, here, in the end, use and Bello did not quite swallow up use and Bello as a popular outcry in the US, prevented or rather postponed yet another uh, assault by American military power on, on a Middle Eastern nation. So it, it seems, that, and others have pointed this out, that use and bellow considerations have almost swallowed up use and bellow thinking uh, in the US, and that the obsession with how we wage war has almost eclipsed the more important question uh, and more fundamental question of whether or not we wage war at all. Now, the developed bodies of the law, uh, laws of armed conflict governing the how of war, this is what Carl Schmitt and others praised about the golden age of intra-European warfare, that war had been successfully demoralized, the wars of religion had been taken out, there were holy wars, there was a certain kind of cold professionalism about them that helped limit the slaughter. Uh, the difference now is that we, we have asymmetrical warfare rather than uh, symmetrical warfare, the kind that Schmidt and others have been nostalgic for. And most of the wars that have been fought since World War II are asymmetrical. Of course, there's always degrees of symmetry and asymmetry, but uh, it's, you can list the number of wars since World War II that are authentically symmetrical or really seem to fit that category on uh, you know, probably one hand, there's the Iran-Iraq War, the Somalia, or, or the Ethiopia-Eritrea War. And uh, I'll note, just in passing, that uh, although IHL could have had some purchase and potentially might have limited the slaughter in the Iran-Iraq War, it was American intervention at the UN that stifled attempts to censure Iraq for its use of poison gas against Iran. Uh, future wars involving the United States are almost certainly going to be asymmetric, uh, whether in urban spaces, as envisioned by David Kilcullen and others, or, or not. Uh, and it's important that we under, and at, at the same time, we see the growing prominence of law talk in our war. Uh, far from not caring about international law, I see the public discourse about war in this country being hyper-legalized, often to the detriment of more first-order questions of politics, consequence, consequences, prudence, and morality. Uh, so it's important, I think, to understand the law talk of asymmetric wars, and uh, that's why this conference is such a useful addition. Um, leading to an attempt to 
create new, new law. Shara? Um, so when the Beirut bomb went off, the day before the Paris bomb, uh, the US press talked about this as being Hezbollah stronghold in territory. So uh, there's an epistemological sort of distinction between what Paris represents and what Beirut represents, and one is okay and one is not okay. And I think that goes directly to what Chase is talking about. There's a long history here. If we think of the issue of human shielding as having a genealogy from way before the on, I think it is the best big picture which I think Chase is pointing towards. So I wanted to say something about what might be in this big picture as a way of throwing more stuff onto this. And it, and it just really shows how, how fruitful the discussion has been, what a great opportunity this is, to look a little bit about some of the other genealogies. I mean, there's, of course, a genealogy, you didn't use the words, but it's separate colonialism, mm -hmm. is what it is. Yeah. And the fact that the United States and Israel are both separate colonial societies is not an accident in terms of this, is it a dog or is it the tail, I mean, who's wagging who? I think, you know, I think we make a persuasive case that the dog is the United States and Israel just a little blip on a much larger trajectory. So in that sense, so this unification of IHL is really just a sort of a minor blip on the much longer process. It goes back three, four hundred years, and it's very much shaped by that process. So, um, so what's the stake of that process? It's a question of sovereignty. It's a question of statelessness. So the distinction in the past was between people and non-people. They were all like living things. But people had a right to sovereignty to territory, and non people didn't. And the question of Palestine Israel is again central here because until today, the iron law of the whole conflict has been the refusal of Israel to recognize the Palestinians as a political community. They have religious and civil rights, but not a political rights. So without political rights, without stateless, without state sovereignty, then they are subject to the same rules of, of violence that American Indians were. It's as simple as that. So the question of civilized or not civilized, people or non-people, all come up around the issue of sovereignty. And perhaps that is the sort of the bedrock for the analysis in the sense that sovereignty also makes no sense other outside the whole notion of the nation state. Mm -hmm. And if the nation state is uh, the key part, then symmetrical warfare, IHL, and the way that whole thing you can't just tinker with it a little bit because actually it's, it's implicated in a much larger system that has this other dark side. Now I would then go to Chase and say uh, there's a distinction between imperial violence, between colonial violence, and between several colonial violence. And they produce their own kind of genealogies of law. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's a lot of the productive discussion could be taken there. What is specific to each kind of genealogy here? And I think they do differ a lot uh, in, in the way that they operate. Uh, and this kind of skin of Europe feeling sorry for itself because World War I, World War II, saying now we have the Hague, and now we have the Geneva, and that's the new universalism. It's, it's accepting the debate on those terms, it's accepting all these zones that were made invisible of violence that made this claim of universalism possible in the first place. So the very lack of interrogation of the word human in international humanitarian law, it means that the terms of reference are being accepted. Uh, and who is a human, who is not a human, who is people, who is not people, who is civilized, who is not civilized, that would be a larger question, I think, that would put this context uh, for this debate. So it's a comment, that question. Sure, I was actually passing notes to Nicole when making many similar points. Um, but I wanted to. Uh, Don't you text? I didn't think people passed notes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, pretend as we can. Anyway, possible. Anyway, I wanted to bring specific aspects of that to light and also to tie a bit more to um, Professor Hajar's points. Um, Specifically, what are the ways, as a framework of what are the ways in which the gradual articulation of international humanitarian law strips colonized peoples of sovereignty and personhood? 
what are the specific ways in which that gets articulated? And as you, as you point out, the politics of human shielding are one aspect of that. The framing of certain cases as murder as opposed to killing in battle is another aspect of that. And to go to your point, points of question, John, um, the particular ways in which Palestinian fighters are framed um, invite uh, very distinct parallels. And this goes back to a discussion that um, Professor Scott and uh, those of us were having just before the lunch break. Um, going back to the question of what makes this moment distinct? What makes the term hum uh, human shielding salient? What has changed since the conflicts of uh, the middle of the 20th century that have precipitated this discursive shift? Um, and part of that is a new wave in the settler colonial moment in which you're having to justify it uh, through modes of um, policing, modes of governmentality, um, a shift, a, a denial of sovereignty of these subjugated peoples. It is a means to deny that sovereignty, much in the way that accusations of murder as opposed to um, framing in terms of uh, killing a battlefield is a, is a similar strategy um, to police Gaza as opposed to wage war against it because to wage war um, is to legitimize the claim to sovereignty. It is an operation, it is not a war, which, it, which um, is particularly salient in relation, particularly salient given that there were ongoing operations in both Gaza and the West Bank during, during 2014 employ many of the same tactics um, and all toward this pursuit of denying Palestinian sovereignty. Just, just real quickly, um, I'm kind of with Bruce. Uh, I don't see what the Israelis are doing as really influencing the development of the customary international law, especially the specific instances that, that you talked about. I, I do think, though, that um, especially the very the, that film that you showed, that's the kind of thing that has circulated in U.S. military circles. I do think that, and I'd be interested in hearing either, uh, a lot of military people are thinking, look at all the Israelis are doing. They're phoning people, they're doing roof knocks, or, and they're still getting slammed in the, in the public. You know, what, what are you lawyers telling us about that this is? Um, Chase, brilliant. What a brilliant, I don't agree with everything, but a very a brilliant presentation. And what we might want to add to the dialogue is the case of U.S. v. Plenty Horses, where, do um, you know what I'm talking about, Chase? This is where Plenty Horses, uh, that was the name of it. And actually, the U.S. military testified in favor of him because he had killed a negotiator, a lieutenant. And uh, they testified, and General Cook was called, they sent somebody else and testified, yeah, we're, we're in a war with them. Now, why do you think they did that? It was shortly after uh, Wounded Knee. So if you're thinking, of, you need to, you better be in a war where you can, every status space targeting and so forth. And so I think that's a, an, an in interesting footnote. Uh, your observation about sovereignty looms large in international law because let's remember the ICJ nuclear weapons case. It goes through page after page after page of how horrible nuclear weapons, it can't possibly do. And then at the end of the day, they said, but we cannot say that their use would be unlawful if the survival of the state is at stake. So ultimately still in international law. In other words, we can't say that they're illegal if there's going to be genocide of you know, half the planet. It's survival of the state, and no qualifications on the kind of state, but just the state, so it does loom large. Chase, what I really want to ask you, and just get your reflections, I would suggest that in the era of the all-volunteer force, one of the reasons the law of war that plays so big in the U.S. military, yes, there is this external we need to look like we're doing the right things to our allies and public support. But 
there's a real internal purpose because you can't get people, normal people, to kill other human beings in th that they don't know and have no reason necessarily, personally, to pick a fight with them unless they know that what they're doing is the right thing. And there's an interesting article that a University of Virginia professor wrote because, as you might recall, there was this little rebellion among military lawyers during the, the torture. And it, military lawyers were kind of extolled as being these higher moral creatures. But allow me to say it was more about understanding that troops need to know and not have to be sitting down and thinking through that what they're being asked to do is legal and moral. And that's one reason why the US military has 10,000 lawyers. Because that is a, it's a, I want to say it's this philosophical, and I think there's an element of that, but I also think it has very pragmatic military reasons. Yeah. And I wonder if you've thought about that. I'd love to hear your, your reaction. One more question, and, or two more questions, okay? Can you take two more? So, uh, Bonnie and Peter. Um, great, thank you for uh, two brilliant presentations. Um, Chase, I have a question. Um, in your presentation, several times you alluded to how Carl Schmitt depicts, sort of with nostalgia, this period of the uh, Republic of Europeum, right? And um, sort of you, you painted it, we know that the colonial is out, but you painted it as sort of this conflict between symmetrical forces, state forces. But historical uh, research, just scholars, for instance, I'm thinking like Janice Thompson and um, Munkler, like they've shown that actually even during this period, it's very difficult to call what was happening in terms of warfare as a warfare between states. Like there were so many non-state actors involved, like pirates and privateers and mercantile companies and mercenaries, etc. So I wondered that even if during that like glorified period, if this was simply an idealization um, that has very little correspondence in reality, I, I just wanted you to speak to that a little yeah. bit. Um, and uh, Lisa, I, I was especially uh, interested in the way that you uh, opened up the question of the humanitarianism of human in the beginning, linking it to the uh, radical abolitionism um, uh, movement, and then sort of looking at what that humanitarianism has come to, in a way. So it made me think that perhaps, I mean, are we um, doing ourselves a disservice by uh, still deploying this term, in a way, do we not need to really separate out sort of the radical humanism that um, uh, people who have not been counted as human appeal to in order to establish their belonging to a universal human community versus the way in which that humanism gets reinscribed as a tool of re-subjugating and creating new hierarchies among uh, humanity, sort of killing actual humans in the name of humanity, for example. Um, and, and in that, in that uh, context, I mean, continuing the Carl Schmitt sort of dimension, uh, I think it was Schmitt who once said, whoever uh, appeals to humanity during war is cheating. Right, so like, or using it as an excuse to have the most inhumane forms of uh, it, violence. Exactly. So, so I wonder how we unpack that term and whether this, this bifurcation is uh, something that we need to be more uh, cognizant of. Uh, Professor Hajjad, one thing I wanted to add to the idea of the post hoc justification, which is that uh, Israel has also started doing preemptive justification. So, um, in the case of 2010, they thought there was going to be an escalation with Hezbollah, and Ahmed Barak went to the Washington Post and did an interview basically saying that he thought that uh, there were large parts of South Lebanon that had to be constituted as human shields, preemptively, if there was to be um, an engagement in Lebanon. And then this past May, when there were skirmishes and they thought there was going to be an escalation in southern Lebanon, um, something really strange happened, which is that the IDF went to the New York Times and asked them to publish an article, and they gave them these images, very similar to the ones on screen, of showing Southern Lebanon and saying, we're showing you right now, should anything happen, 
here are the human shields, we have them even prior to any military engagement. And so I was sort of wondering how the idea of a preemptive justification um, sort of then changes the stakes of it. Okay. Chase, why don't you begin? Let me go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so first, uh, Bashar Damani, yeah, I mean, the term settler colonialism is very useful, that concept. Uh, as to the tail wagging the dog, dog wagging the tail, I, I happen to think that the Israel lobby is the biggest piece of the puzzle that explains the U.S. lavish, lavish sponsorship of Israel as a client's shape. But there's no question that a shared culture uh, and uh, shared mentality of settler colonialism and you know, some shared folklore about that plays into that and reinforces that. Uh, and, uh, uh, Charlie Dunlap. Yes, I have thought about uh, that question that you ask, and, and you know the necessity of law and war. And it's very interesting because frequently, you know, hardline critics of the law and war, who are revanchists, like to tie in overly restrictive rules of engagement as part of the Dolstoss legenda that made us lose in Vietnam. We had our hands tied behind our back, thanks to the pesky you know, rules of engagement. And also, to a degree, in Afghanistan, you know, they're both really restricted. We need to just get rid of them. I mean, that's something that I think even, you know, Donald Trump is saying now. Uh, and the, the thing is, uh, You're quoting Donald Trump? I'm quoting <laughs> Donald Trump in this. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking. Uh, American politics changed. Uh, it's, it it's almost seems like a, a challenging hypothetical to defenders of, of IHL that will, do you think, or to critics of IHL, you know, like many of us here, okay, if IHL is so bad, what would happen if we just took it away? Would, would you be happy then? And for the reasons that you were you know, getting at, I, it's not possible. I don't think you can imagine a modern military without a lot of law and lawyers and IHL any more than you can imagine a human without a circulatory system. It is simply who we are, how these organizations function, and law is what helps organize them. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's very key. And, uh, uh, Bonu, uh, is Schmidt's idealization of, of that period accurate? You know, I am unfamiliar with this historiography that you mentioned. I, I suspect I would agree with it. But I think idealization or not, it's incredibly important and significant in the discourse of international law today, even if it is a, a mythology of an idealized past. And I think there's still, it, it's no less forceful and present for being vocal. Okay. You're gonna answer Julia or who? Wait, I mean, there's a whole bunch. Well, <laughs> I, I, so on the question of Pingo Juris, I'm not a lawyer, and I think that some of the, um, but you know, I think that the presumption that the Israeli model will not become increasingly influential is, uh, you know, that's a very optimistic thought, given the fact that it would be very convenient for other countries to basically civilianize their own soldiers uh, and to you know, make certain kinds of arguments about uh, you know, sort of the, the, sh the blame shifting of culpability on the bombings with the kinds of human shielding arguments. But I would say just on the question of what, what gets accepted as law, uh, you know, Israel, of course, pioneered the legalization of torture. The United States followed the model, but that did not, that sort of fell on the, sh or was dashed on the shoals, perhaps, of the video jurist. But the high court decision, the Israeli high court decision on targeted killing is now sort of being, moving into it. It's become adopted by the United States. I mean, I think that the Israeli model on that score already indicates, you know, and, and whether, although the, Brit uh, the British <clears throat> legal justification for the targeting of its own civilians remains secret, it probably just, you know, kind of, borrowed and copied the still classified US document. I think we're talking about events that are fairly recent, but one could say that the Israeli model could be very convenient and then other governments sort of follow practice. So whether opinio juris is, I mean, that doesn't seem like a very particularly useful shield against this becoming a model, uh, you know, by the ideas of state practice and other states rationalizing those things. Uh, Julia, you were asking about what makes this moment or this kind of shift in the 
rhetoric um, and sort of the combination of the practices of violence and illegal justifying rhetoric is what makes this moment distinct. There are many, and I, I do think it is a distinct sort of a moment, uh, you know, in the sense of it's, yeah, you know, sort of re, um, they're pivoting around, you know, certain kinds of baseline conceptions. But if you'd ask me as a sociologist, what makes this moment distinct, I think that uh, one example of understanding it would be arguments put forward by a number of people, but perhaps most, you know, sort of thoroughly by Max Blumenthal. I mean, what we're seeing in in the context of Israel uh, is this um, new wave of, of settler colonial, uh, religio nationalist, extreme xenophobic, particularistic attitudes to which the very underlying conceptions of humanitarianism are completely alien and, and obscure, you know, and uh, irrelevant. And so, for example, we see the lionization of uh, the colonel, I forget what his first name is, Winter, who was the first one oh. to actually invoke the Hannibal Directive during the, you know, Shujia operation. This guy comes straight out of this extreme radical right-wing religious ethno-national thing, and they're taking over, you know, sort of the military. So I think that there's something about the, you know, sort of political complexion of Israel as a result of these kind of changing politics and demographics, and, and particularly the way in which it's being integrated into the military, including into the military law division. So I think that that would be an example. Um, in terms of, uh, Bonnie, your question about is humanitarianism a problematic term and allows for resubjugation? I think that's a very good argument. I personally, and for political reasons, want to say, I love IHL. We, you know, international criminal law, it's a good, let's get some people punished. And you need IHL for those kind of things. And I am a huge fan of the retributive violence of the law, particularly against state agents. And so I'm not going to let that thing go <laughs> at all, ever. <laughs> and uh, is um, there a preemptive justification? Uh, you know, is, I mean, certainly Israel is doing this. I mean, what we now know about Israeli strategizing is that they're they're now arguing that they have a, a like a preemptive right to engage in certain kind of bombings as preemptively defensive if they anticipate that any site individuals or whatever can pose a threat within five years. Like not, I mean, there's so imminence has been, and of course other governments have sort of, you know, the United States is certainly right up there. But um, so for example, the ability, or, or Israel's claim right to bomb agricultural fields, you know, in the, in the 2004 thing, is that, that within five years those fields may be the sites of missile uh, things. So, I mean, we see Israel constantly, you know, sort of entrepreneuring certain things and the degree to which other militaries, other intelligence agencies will find those practices tempting and then you'll get sort of governments and publics coming on afterwards. So certainly I think that the, Israel has a very interesting, but it's, that's why I think it's important for us to understand a, how Israel comes up with these uh, the legal arguments, what the empirical bases are, and can we then criticize them on the basis of current standards of law. Can I make a follow-up point, with Lisa, since we're having a discussion? <laughs> um, I mean, one of the things, it, it's not enough to just um, cite people who make certain kinds of arguments. It needs general acceptance. I mean, then the examples you give, like with torture, um, it's not that only that both Israel and, and U.S. administrations made these legal arguments. They were challenged. I mean, in the United States, John Yu was almost disbarred in, in uh, California. Um, in Israel, the reason it reached the Supreme Court is because there were a number of human rights organizations in Israel challenging the torture policy. Mm -hmm. So, and the targeted killing decision basically says, yeah. They made the, right. I'm not saying that these decisions aren't made, but to achieve general acceptance, it's not enough to just make the claim even if you get a court to approve it. As far as I can see, at this point, I see no evidence that this is achieved general acceptance, even within their own country. I mean, the United yeah. States, there's plenty. You read the international law journals. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a PhD in political science, but I read the international law journals. This, this is raging. I mean, you've written some articles, and uh, Michael Schmidt and others. It's, it's, none of this is settled. This is oh, absolutely, but I'm just saying that, in fact, that was the point. My final point was in a sense that there's a model being projected, but yeah. it's not yet set. So that's, it's a question of whether Israel's practices will be compassed. Fair enough. Uh, uh, I'm sympathetic with the idea of combining genealogies. Uh, 
but I'm not sure. I, I, I have to confess that I'm a little bit lost if we reinterpret the present as a repetition of the past, or there's nothing new, uh, or I, I'm not sure that Palestinian, but Palestinians and other people who are targeted by different wars are framed as uh, non-humans. Uh, if they are uncivilized, they are uncivilized civilians. Again, I want to go back to, to, to the point at the end of the day. Before killing those those populations, those populations are framed as, as part of a, of a common humanity. Civilianhood is a category here. So, to go back to your point, Lisa, I'm, I'm wondering how, how more hegemonic the Dahya doctrine is than uh, an attempt to kill according to proportionality. So how really disproportionality is functioning uh, and total dehumanization is functioning in a more hegemonic way than all those attempts to abide to, to international law like, like human shielding and like human shielding claims. So I, I'm not sure. I don't understand. Is your energy question? Is really disproportionality what makes those doctrines hegemonic, and is the Dahia doctrine really hegemonic, or what is becoming hegemonic is an attempt to abide to proportionality and to show that certain uh, forms of violence are responding to uh, a principle of proportionality. Uh, if we go to the, to the, to the law of war manual, uh, the law of war manual is not saying, you know, we are going to kill this proportion. We are going to kill proportion, uh, and that's the, and that's the framework of reference. And and the UK army is saying, you know, we're not we're going, we're going to kill proportionately. Nobody, I mean, some, some in some exceptional occasions, probably the head doctrine is going to be uh, used as an example. But I hardly believe that that model is going to become the norm. Uh, not because they produce two different effects. I mean, the, the effects of violence probably are going to be the same. Uh, but in terms of political hegemony, I'm, I'm wondering if, if we are still in a world in which those who are killed are uncivilized and totally uncivilized and brutalized, or if uh, massive killing is killing out, it is carried out in the name of some kind of form of humanization, and, and if we are in, in what uh, Samurai Smear uh, calls uh, juridical humanity, a situation of juridical humanity in which extreme violence and, and punishment is is proportion, is, is measure, is. Yes, Julia? A different question, somewhat related to that. So these two talks do a brilliant job of illustrating the ways in which, around the issue of human shielding, but among other concepts as well, the division between civilian and combatant is word. But these two talks not only illustrate how, as Nicola Yorin Neve's paper illustrates how the term human shield de-civilianizes civilians, your talks show how, to, to a degree. No, we actually, I don't, like, that wouldn't the, be a, but, 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 but you need the civilian. Yeah, you do you need the civilian, but in, um, in scribing civilian deaths with this separate label as human shields, it puts them in a liminal space that legalizes them. Um, to, there is, a, that is matched in certain ways by this civilianizing of Israeli soldiers, of prioritizing um, the lives and, and the protect, and the prevention of deaths of, of the civilized people over that of the uncivilized. But, um, Chase, your, your talk also highlights how the problematization of civilian versus combatant status works as a, as a separate strategy of denying sovereignty, of saying that these um, 
indigenous people, these uh, indigenous peoples are not combatants because they are not fighting for us. They're not, they're not soldiers because they're not fighting for a state. So to think of, within the framework of inscribing or denying sovereignty, the ways in which the category of civilian protection is problematized from both ends, I think is a useful framework device to think about in general, and how that becomes used to enforce uh, imperialist and settled or colonial frameworks distinct from each other and also working together. Lisa, can you begin? Sure. We have five minutes and then we're going to have coffee. Okay. Um, I don't argue that the Dahi doctrine is currently hegemonic. I mean, that's a question. You know, it's like it's, uh, but, um, and you said, or is it an attempt to abide by proportionality? So, from, so it's not hegemonic, but it is an attempt to abide by proportionality, but it's through this kind of perverse interpretation, you know, that's, that, that Israeli lawyers go to far greater lengths to engage in first than the, you know, militaries of other countries, but it is the sophistication of those kinds of legal arguments coupled with the benefits that may derive from enemies in asymmetric wars that makes this model sort of appealing and, and could whether it becomes hegemonic or not, it certainly uh, would spread. But you know, in a sense, um, we can think about the kind of inter the, the politics of interpretation. You know, that says that you know, killing civilians is in fact an effort to abide by the laws. You two sort of you know critically point out it's like the Robert Cover point about uh, you know the violence of the law. Like the law itself takes place on a field of death and pain, and that's nowhere more true than international humanitarian law. But I think that you know, this is was sort of my last point of the paper was that this also allows not us to just sit back and say, gee, I wonder if these military lawyers are gonna to get to create something that will become hegemonic. It gives us space to push back, to counter interpret, to mock and ridicule, to you know, you know, delegitimize, to do all the very things that is the very reason why, you know, Israel, Israeli officials and their supporters regard lawfare as a strategic threat. That's why lawfare is awesome, right? That's why lawfare is, you know, great. So you actually don't just let military lawyers, you know, have the last word, but actually go and fight on the terrain of law about their interpretations, because it is, in fact, the delegitimization of these kinds of arguments is actually critical to preventing Israeli models from becoming the new custom. I, I just have one question. I mean, we've been talking about the inability or unwillingness to recognize non-state actors legally as legitimate actors because they're not states. And one question that I've had on my mind for a while, and maybe the, the experts can point me in the right direction is, can anything be learned about the history of recognizing republics as they came onto the scene? First, the Dutch Republic, and then you know others, because they too were outside of protocol. They were outside the family kinship networks of the other heads of state, and they were seen as you know, brash, tacky, hairy beasts onto the scene. Not exactly the way non-state actors are today, but it took a while to digest republics, and I'm wondering if that might illuminate any possible avenues for uh, dealing with non-state actors in a legal and pacific way, unlike the way we do today. At least in the United States, well, in, in the history of international law, I think it's somewhere in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, after the emergence of at least the French and the American republics, that the question of international law and what counts as national sovereignty is first negotiated. So, that's where I would look, I think. Thank you, Professor Scott. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to call me Professor Scott. Okay. <laughs> you ask the question. So we're, we're gonna, it's 3.30. We're going to okay. stop a minute. Uh, do you want you want to? Oh, we might have talked about this in the first panel, but that, that I think it, at least in your work on torture, gravitates more in this area than the home station in the last minutes. But in terms of focusing on state, non-state, asymmetries, disproportionality, um, and the figure of humanity, as you're pointing out in that, it's kind of um, how to understand humanity as being produced out of not just histories of war and, and humanitarian law, but also 
histories of settler colonialism and the operations in which they operationalize the body. But what I did talk about, at least in this panel, is, is of course the soul, right? It's not state or non-state, it's humanity and which humans are constituted as having a soul and whose souls are possessed by who and what demonic forces or what civilized forces. So the idea of a human shield, you could read it back into kind of inquisitional law or colonial canon law, very much the, the person who's shielding something that's not their own soul. And so it's not about whether you're state or non-state, but there's a much longer tradition of deciding which breeds of humanity are possessed by their own soul. And that has a, lot, a long set of legal traditions. It's really interesting and complicated, much more nuanced than state versus non-state, or regular versus, versus regular, right? And that's torture, in a, in a sense, is our way of talking about that old inquisitional canon law sets of practices, which are about figuring, operationalizing whose soul is inside whose body, because it's not necessarily identical, right? There's all sorts of forces that constitute souls, and that's the racialization and the, and the modernization process of humanity makes that very simple. And then we try to, you know, but I think what these religious nationalist racists, what new settler colonialism does, what new forms of evangelical populism that are taking over the US military, they draw upon other traditions of seeing the soul as demonological, not as identical to the human self. And those have legal traditions, those have canon law traditions and inquisitional law traditions and Puritan enforcement traditions. And, and so that, you know, it's not therefore we abandon the human, but we see that this goes back way for de las casas in, in the Inquisition to, to another set of debates, not just about war, but it's about who has a soul and therefore who is even capable of being a subject worthy of considering before you dismember them. I mean, I think that uh, you know Blumenthal's you know sort of work on the fact that you know the kind of sectors of the Israeli military that are now very prominent, including this Colonel Winter, mm -hmm. like these are heathens. We are going to smoke them. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's totally you know we're going to smoke them with our uh, you know Apache helicopters. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to be